Hello and good evening, everybody. You're most welcome to this evening's uh, webinar, which is the 22nd in the series of the Let's Talk Equine webinars. Um, you're all very, very welcome uh, wherever you're joining from, us from around the country. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Wendy Conlon. I'm an equine specialist with Chagas. And just, I suppose, a bit of housekeeping to begin with, this webinar is being recorded this evening with a view to making it available on www.chagas.ie forward slash let's talk equine in the coming days. I'm joined here this evening by uh, Dr. Neve Lewis of UCD and Neve, you're very, very welcome uh, and thank you for joining us this evening. Your uh, mute button is on, which is the uh, interminable issue of uh, 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 Zoom, shall we say, and um, you're, you're very welcome for joining us here this evening. And I just want to say to our viewers tonight as well that uh, you have a Q&A button um, available to you. It should be at the bottom of your Zoom screens for most and really would encourage you to use the opportunity to submit your questions to um, me here this evening. Uh, this is your time, so you use that button and uh, pass those questions along to us. So um, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction uh, to Neve to begin with. Um, Neve, um, Neve uh, you, you graduated from Edinburgh University in 2008 and following that spent several years in clinical practice in Ireland, Australia, the UK, America and Saudi Arabia, which must have been a very interesting experience indeed. And subsequently, then you completed a residency program at the University of Liverpool before um, becoming a European and American registered specialist in equine reproduction in 2015, from what I gather. And you, you were also responsible for instituting the first uh, commercial ICSI facility in the UK from design right through to operation while you were in Liverpool. So again, another very interesting experience that that must have been as well. And uh, you might maybe pick up the story for us, Neve, in the sense of you know, your current role with UCD and, and what you're doing there and what you hope to achieve in, in your work there, maybe to, to, to start us off. And like I say, you're very, very welcome uh, joining us here this evening. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, yeah, so that kind of took me up until around 2017. So I did a PhD um, in kind of perfecting the ICSI process and a lot of the embryo culture protocols, um, which I finished in 2019. Um, and then I kind of was working closely with UCD and then finally got a um, assistant professor lectureship there um, beginning just last June. Um, and since then, we've been kind of setting up our um, oven pickup service, which is now up and running. Um, and we also have set up an ICSI lab, which we're kind of about to start um, with now. Um, and then obviously the teaching of the veterinary students. And I do a lot of infertility kind of referrals um, and also kind of getting the research back up and running as well in terms of like the embryo metabolism work that I'm interested in. So kind of a lot to get my teeth stuck into there. <laughs> Sounds like a very busy day to me, Neve. Yeah. <laughs> A lot on, a lot on. But you're, you're going to take us through um, assisted reproductive technologies here this evening and talk to us a little bit about, about that. And, and um, we will have some natural breaks in the presentation as well, where there will be opportunity to deal with questions from our audience here tonight. And I'm really hopeful that people will actually, you know, click that button and write the questions in and, and engage us in the conversation. Yeah, please do. So I'll kind of um, chat away. Um, as I said, I'll kind of introduce the topics and um, kind of it's my bread and butter at this stage. I kind of very narrowly specialize now and I'm um, pretty much just assisted reproduction. So kind of go through um, how we do it and why we would do it. And then a little bit of the kind of nuts and bolts of the cost and kind of what type of merit suitable for um, and what type of merit's not suitable for as well. All, all um, the important bits. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I can um, get up the presentation whenever whenever you're ready. Yeah, you can work away there. You can pull up a share that's screen great. there. That's, that's, that would be perfect. Perfect. Yes, so you, you can, can see, see that. that. Great. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so kind of covering it from start to finish. Um, and I'll just kind of cover again, I always kind of introduce this slide of kind of what I've done so far. You kind of give a really excellent kind of overview of what it was. Um, but basically, yeah, I graduated from Edinburgh 
Um, and my first job was then in Ireland. Um, I did an internship at Lissadell Equine Hospital in Navin, in Meath. Um, and then after that, I went to um, Australia to do a stud season straight off after that, um, followed by like a full medicine fellowship at Haggard's in Kentucky, which is kind of all neonatal full medicine. And it kind of got me stuck into the passion of proper stud work. Um, and after a few seasons kind of going back and forth there, um, I ended up back in Ireland. I worked in Donegal for six months, actually, in first opinion neckwind practice. Um, and then started my residency in Liverpool. Um, there's a little bit of a delay. Oh, here we go. Um, and there we set up the ICSI service and we had our first foal born in 2015. Um, and then every winter while I was there, I spent it just outside Riyadh um, in Saudi Arabia doing um, kind of frozen AI and embryo transfer on a show Arab stud farm. Um, and at the time, we kind of had the number one stallion in the world that we froze and kind of distributed semen for. Um, and kind of got to experience that side of um, the equine industry and all the shows. Very different, yes. Very, very different, yeah. Um, and kind of just excellent to be a fly on the wall um, while I was there. And then we went to, and um, that's when I did my specialist training. And then that brings me to my PhD. And we went and then came back here to Ireland and started in UCD. Um, so yeah, as you said, this is very much a kind of interactive session. And um, I've kind of got this icon throughout of natural progressions, um, which will be really good for people to kind of ask what they want or comments or disagreements. And um, I'm kind of open to all of it. And then, yeah, this is a disclaimer. I always think after my presentations, people have like way more questions than they do answers. Um, so I'm not oh, going to apologize. I appreciate this. questions when they come in. I think that's, yeah, that's, that's definitely really important. Happen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is an overview of how I'm going to approach it. So I'll talk a little bit about assisted reproduction in the sport horse industry as it is right now. I'm going to recap on a little bit of the equine reproduction physiology that underpins it all. Um, why we want to produce horses in vitro in the first place, um, a little bit of the history, the process, and then the overview of actually how it works. Um, but I think this slide's really important because I think coming to ART or coming to equine breeding, it's really important to think, what is your measure of success? Because especially as a vet and as a reproduction vet, this is very different for every single one of my clients, you know, so one person might want 20 embryos to market at the end of the season. Another person wants, you know, one full a year so that they can have it as a kind of replacement broodmare on that farm, you know. Um, so I think this is really important in terms of managing people's expectations and managing your own expectations. It's like, what is the product you want to produce? And then what is your measure of success? Um, so kind of the end of the market I deal with at the minute is very much the kind of elite show jumping um, market where the commodity or the kind of measure of success are pretty much at the minute is frozen embryo trade and then a lot of transfer of frozen embryos from ICSI and then set onward selling of either the pregnancy or the foal or the sport horse that's being produced at the end of it. Um, so kind of at my end, it's all about trying to produce the most embryos we can from a given genetic combination. And then just to kind of give you a feel of how this industry is going, like this is now data that's nearly two years old. So it's even a higher kind of increase in higher numbers. And, um, but even in 2019, you're talking about, you know, nearly 6,000 embryos being produced just in Italy. Um, and then obviously you've got a lot of centers in America that are doing the same thing. And then several others in Europe as well. So it's kind of, and it's increased again in 2020 and 2021. So it's kind of big business at the minute. Um, so then in terms of the physiology involved, um, I think I always start with a slide for all my students, all my breeders, all everyone. And I just say, look, the most important thing to remember is that we have to, just because we can doesn't mean we should. And this is the way nature intended horses to be bred. So if there's ever any kind of, I always start with, okay, how can we try to address this infertility issue by kind of winding back the nature clock and kind of doing something that's more physiological, not less physiological. So even though I obviously specialize in IVF, it's not the solution that's you know appropriate for a lot of combinations. So to obviously get that full, there's a lot of things that have to happen in the meantime. So if we kind of think about it from the mare end, 
the mare has to have a normal egg. So the proper term is oocytes. They have to have normal oocytes. And this is a nice equine oocyte here on the right that you can see. Um, and the oocyte has to kind of live in a normal follicle. So, you know, all those lovely black circles that we're going to see in our ultrasound machine, they all have to have be healthy and have healthy eggs inside them. And then for fertilization to occur, the oocytes have to be able to normally escape that follicle. So they have to be able to be ovulated. Fertilization has to occur in the oviduct. So the oviduct has to be of normal anatomy and function for the sperm to actually get there and then allow fertilization to occur. And the embryo then has to get out of the oviduct in the uterus. That transport mechanism has to be kind of correct and normal. And um, in the horse, this kind of is a biological enigma. The oviduct or the fallopian tube is extremely separate environment to the uterus. Um, and we don't really know that much about it. It's kind of like a hidden oasis of properties. Um, but it's one that we can't study very well. And obviously on my side of it, when we're trying to produce embryos in vitro, we're basically trying to replicate a little bit of the body that we don't know that much about. So that's where a lot of the questions and the kind of problems um, arise. Um, and then when the embryo gets into the uterus, we have to have this normal endometrium environment because the horse has like one of the longest um, pre-implantation phases of any species. So it's got 42 days before it's going to make a proper placenta. So it needs to survive on secretions from the uterus. So if that uterus isn't healthy, then the embryo is not going to survive. And um, it also forms the kind of the scaffold for the placenta. So if you haven't got a normal uterus, you're not going to get a normal placenta. The placenta is what's going to give you a healthy foal. Um, so all these things are intertwined. So basically, any issue with any of the reproductive tract is going to minimize your fertility of that given mare. And then obviously we're not going to, we're going to get further and further away from kind of this perfect result that we all, um, we all require. So with that in mind, um, why do we want to produce them in vitro? Um, when we think of it, normal breeding, you know, we've got pasture breeding, we've got live cover, and then we've got artificial insemination with either fresh frozen or chilled semen. And um, so the question really often is that, you know, why does that not work? And then obviously, you know, from now on, it's a disclaimer, we're talking about nothing to do with thoroughbreds um, because obviously none of this is allowed. Um, but given that we do have those options of live cover, natural cover, and, um, you know, we can put them in a the field, they can breed. Why would it not work? And a lot of the time people come to me and say, oh, I want ICSI done because everyone thinks it's the mayor's problem. You know, the mayor, the mayor, the mayor, the mayor gets blamed for everything <laughs> um, that goes wrong. You know, there's no fool. Oh, it must be the mayor's fault. You know, um, but it's, you know, it first of all, it takes, definitely takes two. So it takes the stallion and the mayor and stallion fertility is, you know, massively kind of, um, you know, underplayed in the industry, I think. Like it's not, you know, many people. Fertility people and management, I guess, as well, too. Hugely, yeah. And I think, you know, often the semen's not even examined before it's disseminated. So it's like, who knows if, the, you know, that if there's no sperm or the sperm weren't alive, the mare's definitely not going to get pregnant. And then the mare gets, you know, kerosene. She gets all these treatments and actually there's nothing wrong with the mare. It was just that she didn't get good semen, you know. And then, of course, it can be my fault. It can be the vet's fault um, if, you know, we mistime it or do something that we shouldn't have done. Um, and then the farm manager or the breeder themselves, the person that's managing the mare, you know, we can have per husbandry, um, which again is a huge factor um, to, you know, maximize and minimize fertility. So, you know, don't automatically think, oh, the mare is the problem, you know, there's something wrong. And then again, in terms of the stallion, you know, when we think about bull fertility and other industries and livestock, the genetics of fertility have been mapped out to the nth degree with kind of all fancy genetic combinations. But in the horse, all we have is performance. You know, the horses are not selected for fertility. So actually our male fertility, especially, and also our female fertility is not top of any kind of production list. So it's assumed that, oh yeah, we'll just get a stallion and I've got a mare, but there's a lot more to it. And we're really only scratching the surface in the horse as to, you know, is that stallion fertile and um, could he be more fertile? You know, maybe the whole line of that sire are very infertile, but yet they perform really well. So then they're still going to stand at stud. So we have to keep in mind that fertility has not been selected for, and it definitely isn't a given um, in stallions. Always as well, you know, given the fact that performance is such the issue, oftentimes by the time the decision is made to breed a given mare as well too, you know, she's, she's, she's got time on her clock. Yes, 
definitely um and well you know we'll come on to that now in a minute with the mm. their age because that's a huge huge factor um and then the other thing is you know people often present an a mayor, you know, she's being blamed and then she's just termed a problem mayor. And, you know, people have a book of tricks for a problem mayor. But to me, a problem mayor is just one that doesn't do what you want her to do within the time frame you want. And the list of things that could be wrong with her are pretty much endless. Um, and like the underlying ideology and management really depends on the cause. So we can't really treat a problem or I can't treat a problem mayor in this any two mares in the same way unless I know what the problem is um, and definitely you know ICSI doesn't have to be part of that solution and then I think this is really interesting as well the in terms of realistic expectations because again people might breed with a certain stallion or breed with one straw of frozen semen and they breed twice and the mare doesn't get pregnant and then it's like oh the mare is infertile however like we know from the evidence that these are the expected rates per cycle so if you've got a 60% life cover, fresh AI rate, yeah, if you breed a mare twice and she's not pregnant, there probably is something wrong with the combination. However, if you breed a mare twice with one straw of frozen semen with a 30% chance, there, pro there could be nothing wrong with the mare. It's just statistics. So I think that's really important to keep in mind as well. You know, it's not always you have a problem. Like you have to bear in mind what the expectation is before we decide if that's the problem. A little bit of a delay on my slides for some reason. There we go. Um, so in terms of mare infertility, then when we come on to why there could be a problem with mare, I kind of split it up into failure to cycle, failure to ovulate, and then failure to get pregnant and stay pregnant. And whenever we get to the pregnancy, get pregnant and stay pregnant phase, that's when I split it up into the anatomy. So I say like, okay, she can't get pregnant and stay pregnant you know, because the first two, it means she can't even be bred. But then the third one is we can breed the mare, but there's somewhere along the reproductive tract that there's a problem. So then this is where the kind of diagnostics start is like, okay, we've got a mare that hasn't got a fall at foot. Which one of these issues um, is it due to? Mm -hmm. And the failure to cycle one is interesting because a lot of this is husbandry. Okay. So mares that are too thin, aren't going to cycle well. Mares that are too worried about staying warm, are not going to cycle well. Mares that are worried about trying to find food aren't going to cycle well. And then you've got your kind of underlying causes, like if a mare is slightly cushing oil that's undiagnosed, that's going to affect cyclicity as well. So there's a lot of non-reproductive um, things that will lead into the issue of failure to cycle. Um, in terms of failure to ovulate, um, a lot of you may be aware of this awful phenomenon that's very common in individual mares. We have these anovulatory hemorrhagic follicles. So these are mares that everything looks perfect, they're cycling, you know, you give them their ovulation drug, you inseminate them and nothing happens. The follicle kind of goes bad and it is very common and um, it happens in kind of eight to 10 percent of cycles. Um, and these mares, it's very difficult to get them pregnant because the oocyte never escapes the follicle. And um, we've got increased incidence in older mares and individual mares can be reoffenders. So like I've dealt with some mares in the past, they're kind of every cycle, nearly they're failing to ovulate um, and it can be very frustrating to deal with. There we go. Um, so then we come on to the next one for me, which is probably the biggest factor um, in terms of mare fertility. And it's one actually that we can't do much about. So it's age and age is going to affect oocyte quality. The process of maturation whereby a mare's oocyte is taken from that immature state and then she enters estrus and the follicle matures, the oocyte matures and the oocyte is ovulated is extremely complex. It requires perfection. It requires kind of perfect alignment of the DNA, but a lot of that is what's responsible for it is what goes around or, or go on around the DNA in terms of the machinery in the cytoplasm. So if we haven't got good machinery because of age, we're going to get aberrations in our nuclear material. We're going to get genetic errors, which is then going to increase the chance of um, per oocyte quality. The other thing is age affects endocrinology. So mares don't undergo menopause, but they do kind of undergo um, what we call ovarian senescence. They will eventually cease to cycle at some point, usually in their mid to late twenties. And then the other thing that gets affected is like species or females of all species is the follicular reserve um, is affected. So oocytes numbers diminish with age. 
So a mayor that's 23 is going to have a much smaller pool to deal with than a younger mayor. And unfortunately, we can't do anything about this. You know, this is biology. And no matter how fancy your technique is to produce foal, this is something that we just have to manage our own expectations over. Um, when it comes to tubular tract pathology, we do have a lot of kind of fancy pharmacological and medical interventions that we can do to the mare. You know, these two images here, the mares have fluid, you know, we have oxytocin, we can lavage, we can exercise, we can tease mares. If they have poor perineal conformation, we can do, you know, quite advanced perineal surgery now that kind of corrects that. If we have oviductal blockage, you can see here this kind of bulbous um, extensions in the oviduct um, in the picture on the left. Um, we can unblock oviducts with prostaglandin gel. Um, and again, all of this is much less kind of intervention and much less cost than going all the way to ICSI um, in the first instance. So we kind of come back to our list and, you know, when is ICSI appropriate in these situations? Um, failure to cycle? No, because we need follicles to be able to aspirate the follicles, to be able to do the OPU, to be able to produce the embryos. Um, failure to ovulate, maybe. So if the mare can't ovulate and we can't get that oocyte to escape, we can obviously aspirate the oocyte before and potentially avoid this problem. So ICSI can be a good, um, a good way to overcome that. And then in terms of the tubular tract pathology, it depends on the severity. So if you've got a mild problem with endometritis, you know, we can diagnose it, we can treat it, and you, know, you might not need to go all the way to IVF at all. And however, if you've got kind of a severe cervical tear, the uterus is wide open, it's never going to be hospitable for sperm or an embryo. In that case, okay, yeah, that mare may be a good candidate um, for ICSI. But it's definitely worth doing a kind of holistic look at the problem and examining, you know, what stallion have you used? What have you tried different stallions? What's the marriage problem? You know, if oxytocin can fix it, you, I really don't need to do ICSI with your mare, you know? Um, and I probably spend a lot of time convincing people not to do ICSI than I do actually doing it as well. Um, so then what, what other reasons would we do it? And um, we do a lot of genetic salvage. So if a mare um, kind of dies suddenly or is euthanized due to kind of a colic that can't be, um, can't be fixed or she's on the surgery table and they decide, you know, there's too much necrotic intestine here, we're gonna have to put her to sleep. And um, we can extract those ovaries and, you know, pick up the oocytes from them and then do ICSI as we would from an OPU. Um, and then for stallions, um, we can also do epididymal sperm harvest. So if they die, we can collect the testicles and flush out the epididymis. So kind of that's where all the, the kind of half mature sperm is stored. And we can usually get a good number and good function of those to be able to, um, to get at least an ICSI dose and sometimes even enough for AI as well. And then other clinical applications, and this is a big one, so it's cryopreservation of embryos. So embryos that are flushed on day seven or day eight don't freeze extremely well. So what we can do with ICSI is we can pick them at a much earlier stage that they survive the cryopreservation process quite a bit better. Um, so this is quite good. And kind of at the time in 2012, when we were doing it in England, this was kind of the major exciting thing. It was like the rare breed societies really latched on to this because the idea of having a genetic bank in the freezer should kind of infectious disease hit. There was kind of worry about African horse sickness and different things. Um, and they were really excited about this to try to kind of um, get these breeds, you know, frozen rather than just a frozen semen. Um, but of course, as probably you all know at this stage, the main thing that's driving the use of ART is international trade. So we can freeze the embryos and then we can now export and import them all over the world. Whereas with fresh, embryos that were flushed, we couldn't do that because we only had, you know, 12 to 24 hours to get them in a mare. So it's really changed the landscape of, um, of embryo trade. So that's kind of our first point there. If somebody wants to have a chat about kind of mare suitability before we move on to the kind of nuts and bolts of the process itself. There are some questions in. Um, one question here, it's not, it's not directly on mare suitability, but it, it, it is probably, I suppose, more of a, we have a mare with, with, cyst in, with a cyst in the uterus, which seems to be stopping her ovulating or cycling properly. Any advice to get rid of it? Um, 
So usually just from that, I wouldn't be very clear. So usually a cyst in the uterus is not, doesn't um, influence cyclicity or ovulation because it's quite a lot further away from those two things. And um, the only things that uterine cysts would interfere with would be implantation of the embryo. So if Amira was getting pregnant and then losing the embryo, then I would be concerned that the cyst was causing it. Um, we can do laser ablation of cysts. Um, you can do a hysteroscopy and then put a laser kind of diode to get rid of the cyst. Um, but again, if it's in the uterus, it's probably not the reason she's not cycling or not ovulating. So probably a little bit more investigation is needed, I think. Another question here, which you may or may not wish to answer at the moment, but uh, when do you think the first ICSI foal entirely produced in Ireland will be born? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I hope to have a pregnancy by the end of the summer, so hopefully next summer, yeah. So we're going to hope to transfer um, some embryos like June, July, August time. So I've got to, got to aim for pregnancies by September. That's the, the plan. <laughs> There's a question here in relation to cost, but I know we'll come back to that towards the end of the presentation, so I'll leave that there for now. Yeah. Um, the survival rate of frozen embryos transplanted, i.e. buying a frozen, frozen embryo at auction and implanting it into a recipient mare. I suppose, you know, I mean, the, the, the commercial side, as you, as you mentioned, of, um, you know, embryo trade, it's, it's becoming more and more popular. And at times I think a little bit crazy when I see the prices of the embryos relative to foals themselves. You know, um, what, what, what are the risks there, I suppose, for people? I mean, they, they're really excellent quality. Once they freeze grade one embryos, there, this, uh, there will be a section on this later on as well, but um, yeah. they freeze uh, only kind of grade one good quality embryos and the pregnancy rates are kind of above 70%. So it's high, like equal or higher than you would get with the fresh embryo that you flushed from a mare. And then the live foal rate drops. You get about a 15% embryo loss rate, which is kind of maybe 50% higher than a normal AI or something. Um, so your kind of live foal rate per thawed embryo is about 55%. And um, you can get very good insurance these days. Um, like it's very costly, obviously, because the success rate is so high, but and a lot of people kind of combat that by bulk buying, you know, so for, if they buy four, you know, they're probably going to get two foals and then it all, you know, makes financial sense. Um, but you can get insurance for the full price. And then even some trade deals like an embryo auction, you know, if one mare produces six of the same embryo in a session, the deal might be if you don't get a pregnancy, they just give you another one of the same combination. So it varies widely for each kind of transaction, each kind of, it's like semen deals, you know, they're all, everyone's I was just different. about to say it. It's a little bit like that, that whole side of the, the house as well. It's be, be very clear on what your T's and C's are and what you're getting. Yes, because it's different, yeah, for probably every transaction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll give you one other question before we, we move on to the next uh, slot. It's, um, which vet hospitals in Ireland carry out castration of colts with a view to saving testicles to freeze sperm? Um... So it's a good question. At the minute, none really, like there's nothing to the castration bit as long as they kind of liaise with somebody first so that we, you know, treat the testicles in the right way. So it's not a specialized procedure. So in theory, any vet could do it as long as they make a phone call before of how they need to keep the testicles. And um, we're kind of busy because at the minute our lab doesn't include kind of specialized freezing equipment. And um, so we've been kind of trying to work with other places that freeze semen to kind of facilitate the process and we haven't really done a one from start to finish in Ireland yet like I've done a lot of them when I worked in the UK um, but as I said it's not a specialized thing like any vet practice could do the castration and then once we have the equipment I can get the testicles as long as we've had some forewarning and um, but it'll probably be next season before that's kind of a commercial reality. Um. Perfect. Yeah, I don't know why it's there's something glitchy. Anyway, 
Sorry. We'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> exactly. The show yeah. goes on. <laughs> the show goes on. Um, so um, what is ICSI? Um, for those of you still wondering, and you know, I myself, when I applied for the job in 2011 to kind of set up the first ICSI centre in the UK, I had to Wikipedia what it was. So it's not just you, it's myself included. Um, but yeah, so it's intracytoplasm sperm injection. And basically all it does is it removes the need for the sperm to be able to swim up and penetrate the egg itself. Um, and it was a human technology that was um, developed for male infertility factor. So couples that were undergoing IVF where they couldn't get embryos from putting the eggs and the sperm and the dish together, then they would do ICSI as a way to bypass that and ensure that the embryos were fertilized. Um, in the horse, conventional IVF doesn't work. So that's where the eggs and the sperm go in the dish and you kind of expect embryos to form. Um, as I said, unfortunately, that does not work yet. And we there's a huge kind of international effort to find out why and how, because in other species it does. Um, but at the minute, that's not a reality. So that's why we do ICSI. Um, so how do we actually do it? Um, the first stage is, um, is called ovum pickup, um, and it's done by transvaginal um, aspiration. So we... Um, Those who don't understand the big terminology, maybe break that down and explain that. Um, um, yeah, I've got some little pickles <laughs> coming up here. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with them. Can you see these little circles? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. It's coming in pieces. Um, yeah. It's coming in pieces anyway. Um, but yeah, transvaginal aspiration is basically um, where we aspirate the follicles of the ovaries through the vaginal wall. Um, so what you can see here in this image is I'm holding the ovary and um, with one hand through the rectal wall and then I place the ovary um, against the probe which is in the vagina and then the needle goes in and out of the vaginal wall into the ovary um, and we aspirate each follicle so that we can um, see the oocytes. We've now jumped forward. There we go. And um, so what that's the probe that we use. So that probe handle goes into the vagina and we've got a 60 centimeter needle which fits inside the probe handle. And then the needle is introduced each time into each follicle that we can see. Um, and we kind of flush it up to 10 times each so that we increase the chance of getting the oocyte. Because as you can see here, the oocytes are only like 150 microns. They're tiny. And it's kind of the size of a coffee ground. And you've got kind of a big old follicle. So what we want to do is kind of maximize the chances that our needle is going to flick that off so that we can actually, you know, aspirate it. There is a um, sedation for this process. Um, yeah, it's an understanding sedation. Um, so it's just a kind of a uh, detomidine and um, butorphanol and they're given a flunixin um, non-steroidal so for pain relief and as an anti-inflammatory and they're given buscopan for relaxation of the rectum and then they're given antibiotics to kind of cover them um, for infection risk during the procedure. Um, it's extremely well tolerated and um, the kind of it takes between 30 and 40 minutes probably per mare. Um, and then they're back in the box and they can go home then after that. There is there a physical impact on the mayor after the procedure? Um, so I've just got a slide coming up on that in one second. So I think if it's okay, I will answer. Yeah, absolutely. Plow on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is just a video, um, which is great that it works <laughs> for everything to stop it. <laughs> um, but the, yeah, so you can see here, like I'm holding the ovary and like that's my hand, the bright white on the bottom and I'm kind of massaging the ovary and what we're doing is at the minute here you can see the fluid going back into the follicle that's the needle the bright white line on the right and um, and what we're doing is we're trying to basically collapse the follicle on the needle so that we can then scrape the follicular wall and then hope that we've knocked it off so then when we fill it back up with fluid we're hoping that we suspend it and then the next time we aspirate we're going to get the oocyte and um, in humans and cattle the oocyte is kind of more on, it's like a lamppost, like it's on a stalk. So it's much easier to get them out. The recovery rates are much higher, but in the horse, the attachment is really broad. So you have to kind of work a lot harder to get the, the eggs out. Um, so this is kind of the mare effect side. So the recovery rate, so that is the amount of oocytes you would expect for the number of follicles that you aspirate is 50%. So if we do 10 follicles, our average is 50%. So we get five eggs and um, these recovery rates decrease with advancing age. So older mares have a lower recovery rate. 
Um, it's very well tolerated. So there's no effects on future fertility. Like you can do OPU all winter and then you can do embryo transfer all summer or you can put your mare in foal or whatever you want. Um, mild complications are about one in a hundred. So in terms of like procedures in equine medicine, it's extremely low risk. And um, mild complications would be things like fever or kind of mild discomfort that might resolve within one to three days. Um, and then severe complications are extremely rare. We have data just from October um, and the risk rate is only about one in a thousand. So relatively rare, um, but of course, I think it's really important for people to remember it's not risk free. So it's something to be considered before putting your mare forward for this procedure. It's extremely safe, but it's not completely risk free. Circles again. Okay, so then we are going to ship the oocytes. And um, so we say the ones we collected yesterday, and um, they were packaged up, they were searched for, and then we put them in a plastic vial and we shipped them to Aventea and they arrived there this morning at 10 a.m. So they're shipped in a kind of medical grade transplant organ box and um, that keeps the temperature exactly perfect at 22. And then they're shipped to Aventea. Um, when they arrive there, they undergo um, in vitro maturation. And what this means is basically that um, when we have immature eggs, they've got all their DNA, they've got two copies of each chromosome. But of course, we want the sperm to come along with half of it. So what we have to do is we have to kick out half the DNA. So that's the kind of the, the explanation of what we mean by resuming meiosis. We need half the DNA quantity so that when the sperm comes along, we don't get three copies of all the chromosomes because otherwise we won't get fertilization. Um, and then after this process, we would expect that about 60% of them will be suitable for sperm injection. Um, and then this is the video of what sperm injection actually is. So on the left, we have a holding pipette. The oocyte is in the middle. Um, when we say we kick out half the DNA, that's the little circle at six o'clock at the bottom. Our sperm is in the needle on the right-hand side. We basically rupture the oolema. That's the membrane of the egg. Um, and then just to make sure that we're in there, and then we pop the sperm in and that's the end of it. So the ICSI process itself per egg probably takes, you saw that like 20 to 30 seconds. Um, um, and then once the ICSI has occurred, they're placed in a uh, culture media and then they're placed in a, an incubator in a kind of low oxygen environment. And um, after about a day, fertilization will occur, hopefully. Um, and then after that, then you're going to hopefully expect nice, even, normal cleavage. It's going to go from two cells to four cells to eight cells and so forth. Um, and then we were really lucky in Liverpool. We worked with um, the Liverpool Women's Hospital, which is one of the biggest IVF units in Europe. Um, and we had a collaboration there where we were able to get their time-lapse cameras. So we kind of published the first of these images in the horse. Um, so what these cameras do is they take an image every five minutes. And then you can play it back so you can watch embryo development in real time. So this foal is now, well, it's a five-year-old horse now, but this is it kind of when it became an embryo at the very start. Um, and what's really interesting is you can see the activity inside the embryo. You can see that actually some cells aren't viable, but it doesn't matter. They kind of just choose to leave that material out. The cells keep dividing. Um, this and then, real time now, is this... Is this um, yeah, well, it's better. So it takes one picture every five minutes. And then you've kind of watched seven days development over a minute and a half. So it's not real time. It's kind of much faster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but it means that you can kind of, you know, go in in the morning and check your cameras and see, okay, what was happening? Is it an embryo? Is it not? Is it degenerated? Like what's going on? Um, so it was kind of really exciting to see what was going on. Yeah. Um, so then in terms of what happens, that's going to, that, process takes place so yeah it's not real time at all because that's obviously over seven to eight days and we watched it there in 30 seconds um but it's um kind of between seven and eight days hopefully you expect development and once the embryos are formed you can biopsy them for sex um and we can also freeze them for later transfer um, and there's usually kind of a 10 to 20% blastocyst rate. Um, in reality, it's actually a lot higher. So it can be kind of up to 30% in individual combinations. Um, but the range is kind of zero to a hundred. Um, and then the, if you want to look at the embryos, they can be kind of at day seven, they can't, aren't really that obvious as to what they look like. 
Um, but then as the time goes on, they grow and then they become wider. And um, you can start to see this kind of outer rim here. You can see on day nine, that's the trifectoderm, it's called. So that's going to be the future placenta. So once we see that, we can say, okay, yeah, great. This is um, going to be it. Um, yeah, this is, and you can see there when you look at them all together, you can see it's quite obvious which is the bigger one. Um, sorry, just one second, Wendy, one second. No problem. There's a child in the house, I'd say. <laughs> Thank you for your questions, everybody. I can see there's a few there building up and we'll pass those on in a moment. Sorry. You're all right. Um, okay, so once the embryos are formed, they can be biopsied. Um, and this is probably more done, uh, especially say in the polo industry where they really want filly foals um, or in America where it's really big in quarter horses and barrel racing horses and they carry kind of specific genetic conditions that you would worry about. But over here and in the show jumping world, it's not really, not really a thing. Um, but it's good to know that if you did want to do it, there's no difference between the biopsied and the non-biopsied. So then we transfer them. So on day nine, um, as we saw here, we've got a nice embryo with a trophoblast. Um, we then scan them what would be day 14 after um, fertilization. And you hope to see that kind of perfect black circle that we all wanna see um, on our pregnancy scans. And then this is our kind of first two foals that we had. The first one made the kind of BBC news, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, you kind of hope for normal development. Um, and then obviously a normal foal whenever it's born. That's the kind of most exciting bit. Um, so that's kind of the overview of the, the nuts and bolts of it. Um, and then before we kind of go on to the, the cost end and the success rates and stuff like that. Um, so we're happy to be taking any more questions. There, there are a couple of them um, in here, all right, um, Neve. I'll start with this one that, um, that asks, is Italy the only place that does ICSI? Um, I know some vets in Ireland that do the OPU, but then the, the, the embryos get sent to Italy. Um, yeah, I so there's, um, so as I said, we're hoping to offer it very soon and we've got our lab kind of up and running and that's what I did in England. So that's what we're hoping to do here in UC. But, at the minute, um, Aventea would be by far the kind of busiest place, but there's definitely probably like Ghent University offer it, um, Utrecht University do a little bit. There's a few private practices in Holland and Belgium as well. Um, there's a practice in Denmark that have good success rates um, that kind of do kind of in-house for their own clients. But Aventea would be the main one that has this kind of volume of shipment um, back and forth question is must the mares be hyper ovulated with hormones for collection of multiple oocytes uh nope that's a good question so mares kind of unlike cattle and women um can't be super ovulated so we actually collect immature oocytes and then mature them in the lab so um we don't really have availability of equine fsh and they respond really poorly so we actually just monitor the mares until they're kind of have at least 10 to 15 follicles and then we do the aspiration at that point. So they're not at all hormonally treated whatsoever. Natural fertilization, there's a natural selection of the best sperm for health and suitability. Is there a sperm selection process in ICSI or how does that work? Yeah, so this is a really common question um, that I get as well. So sperm are selected. So the way it works is so you have one straw of frozen semen and usually about a tenth of that straw is cut and, and then placed on the bottom of a tube. And then the, the, basically the good sperm swim to the top and then you take a sample from the top of your tube. So you've already kind of selected the ones that are able to swim that far. And, and then the next thing you do then is you put those sperm um, through a wash again and then the ones that survive the wash are better again. Um, and then whenever you're doing your actual ICSI, like I always would place them on the left-hand side of the drop and then you would choose the ones on the right that are the ones trying to escape from the edge of the drop, you know, and also that magnification, you can see obviously that they're normal morphology, you know, they've got a normal head, normal tail, they've got no defects. And um, so you're definitely trying to select the best one, the best, the one that looks the best and is kind of the most motile. Um, but in terms of natural fertilization, I kind of always challenge that view because I think that 
as soon as you do anything apart from a live cover, you're already splitting the ejaculate. And, you know, with frozen semen, you're using one straw or 10 straws, but it's from a bunch of maybe 45 that were produced from that ejaculate. Um, and I think the biology of it, obviously there's like a science and an art to breeding, but from the science side, I mean, there's nothing about a sperm. The best sperm is the one that can fertilize the egg and the sperm itself, I don't believe anyway, knows that it's going to be the best show jumper or the best race horse or the best barrel horse. So I think function wouldn't really come into it. It would be the function of fertilizing the egg. And in terms of that selection process, we try to replicate it as much as possible with ICSI. And does, does biopsy for sex increase risk of loss? No, not at all. No. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if this is a very kind of fair question in a way, but, but the best places for embryo transfers in Ireland? Um, I think anyone that does it, I'm sure, is quite open with their results um, and you could ask them and then choose for yourself. But I would say that, um, you know, there's plenty of places that offer it um, and that, you know, if you know of good results, then you kind of go with it. Yeah, I think there's a few that are pretty well known, but it's not really the place here to, to get yeah. into that, I think. Um, did, did you say you could um, choose sex, colour or other epigenic, epigenetic features of the ICSI embryos? So you can't choose them, but you can determine them. So if you have an embryo, you can find out all those things about it, but you can't choose them before it's made. So you can kind of, if you have 10 embryos, you can then obviously choose the females or you can choose the ones that are bay, but you can't choose the makeup of individual embryos, if that makes sense. You can't design them in other words. No, you can't design them. Okay. No. Yeah. Um, so there's the possibility there is like um, sex selected sperm, like sex sorted sperm kind of, now obviously available in England fresh and there's some trials undergoing with it in Aventea with ICSI so potentially you might be able to select your sperm but the blastocyst rate the embryo rates are much much lower than they are with just normal sperm so at the minute it would be kind of a hard sell to say oh try that you know it's better to biopsy the embryos. That, that's that's the the integral question for the minute I think we can press on with the next bit me. You're doing great. <laughs> All my pixelated, so I don't know what. Yeah, I, I, would, I won't worry, I won't worry. There we go. Yeah. Um, great. So in terms of results now, um, so I always, this is something that's like quite close to my heart because the embryo production and your success rates really depend on how many follicles you start with. So you can imagine there, we went through all the percentages. If you start with five follicles, you know, it's impossible to get 10 embryos. Okay. So, and in Utrecht and in Holland and in Italy, the average number of follicles that they get in their mares is around 25 to 30 follicles. So their results are around 1.7 to two embryos per OPU session. Whereas my mares in Ireland and, you know, the other practitioner, Larry Dunn, that does it, we talk all the time. And the average number that we see is 10 follicles. So for those 10 follicles, you know, you're not. Why that get... difference, Neve? Why, why that difference? It's something that, like, I think about and talk about with a lot of people. I think that uh, it's going to be something to do with the climate and then also something to do with management. So I think the Irish marriage are probably kept more extensively than they are in the continent and potentially are kind of more in touch with the weather and the actual, like, what's going on around them. Whereas I think the more you know, less extensive they're kept, potentially the more follicles they have, but it's a huge area for research. Like we don't know the answer really. It's stuff that I ponder on often because as you can imagine, you just can't replicate the results they're getting in Holland if you start with a third of the follicles. So actually the fact that we've got 10 starting follicles and we're getting an average of one embryo per session is very good because it's kind of half the embryos for a third of the follicles, but we it's hard to kind of overcome that because we just don't have the starting number um but we still have so three quarters of the mares that i've done have produced one or more embryos so we kind of still are in line with that 75 percent um and then in terms of pregnancy and falling um again that kind of stays the same throughout everything so it's kind of 70 percent pregnancy rate and the falling rate of about 50 to 55 percent um so what else influences outcome um, again, this is the huge one. More embryos are produced, the more follicles are present. So it's kind of worth keep scan. If your mare has six follicles this week, you know, keep scanning her and don't 
to go for PU until she's got more. Um, the other thing is there's decreased number of embryos produced from subfertile mares. So if your mare hasn't been able to produce an embryo in four years and there's something wrong with her, she will have a less embryo rate than a four-year-old mare that has nothing wrong with her. So that biology still stands. Um, but up to the age of around 20, it's not influenced by mare age. So you would kind of expect your embryo rates to drop from a normal ET or AI from around 17 onwards. However, with OPU and ICSI, it doesn't really drop till around, you know, 21 or something like that. Um, and it's not affected by season, so we can do OPU all year round. Um, and it's not really perfected or impacted by performance as much as kind of AI and embryo transfer is. Um, and then in terms of this is kind of just an interesting thing that interests me anyway, is that speed of development influences falling rate and sex ratio. So the embryos that develop faster um, are kind of better quality and that they have a higher falling rate, but they're also more likely to be male. So you get a 71% quote ratio when you have day seven, day seven embryos and you have a 46% falling rate for day eight and a more 50-50 cold to filly ratio. Um, and then in terms of breed, this is a big one. Um, so Arabians, and having worked with them so much in Saudi Arabia, they have generally bad fertility, um, even with AI and embryo transfer, um, but they also perform much worse in an ICSI program as well. Um, and then there's a huge individual mare effect. So I've got some mares that produce an embryo every single time they do OPU. Um, and then once you have a mare that has produced an embryo, she's very likely to keep producing embryos. Whereas if you've got a mare that doesn't produce embryos, then, you know, after two goes, it's kind of time to say, okay, maybe this isn't going to work, you know? Um, and then in terms of the styling sides, we kind of went on around the start about how important the styling fertility was, but actually in ICSI, there's a lot less variability attributable to the stallion than there is to the mare. But what we do see is a batch of semen effect. So you can imagine if there's a straw that's kind of changed hand 25 times and people have kind of looked at it out of the liquid nitrogen too much. And, you know, so that straw is affected. So it's nothing to do with the fertility of that stallion. It's to do with the quality of the management of the straw. And often you don't know that until you start using the straw, which can kind of be frustrating for people. Um, but it's often not because of the stallion identity, more because the something happened with the straw. Um, and then here's the kind of numbers game slide. So I worked on this with my um, friend Patrick in Utrecht. So this is kind of what we did as we said, right, okay, if we did these three techniques a hundred times, how many embryos would we get? How many pregnancies and how many falls? So obviously for AI, we don't get embryos, you know, so we skip straight to the fall stage. So if we say for embryo transfer and for AI with live cover, we're going to get an average of around 60 pregnancies or 60 embryos. Um, if we do embryo transfer, we're going to lose a few of those. So we're going to end up with 45 pregnancies um, with a 10% loss rate. You're looking then an overall chance of a live fall. And, you know, your best case average scenario is 54% with AI, 40% with embryo transfer. But you can see with ICSI, it's a lot higher because you're starting with those extra embryos. Um, but that kind of comes with a much extra cost. So the average cost per full produced, and um, you can see here, it's kind of, you know, obviously depending on this, this doesn't include any stallion fees. And often when you're doing XC, the stallion fee is a lot higher than what you're using if you're doing AI or ET. Um, but on average, like I usually tell people, unless the full is worth at least 10,000, if you're doing it for commercial reasons, then OPU XC is not going to be uh, kind of financially viable um, kind of way to produce your horses. Um, because, you know, you do still have the recipient costs and you've got that much higher initial cost, like the starting off bit is around 2000 and um, that people would pay for the OPU and kind of having a go. And then each embryo is 500 and then you've got your semen fee and everything else. So kind of, you need to kind of think on that 7,000 um, figure in terms of falls produced and that's taken into account your loss rates and everything else. Definitely something that you have got to have have the right genetics, I guess, in, in place to start with as well too in making that decision. That it's, oh, of course, it's, it's yeah, carrots, the, yeah, the, the outcome. exactly. Um, yeah, because if you yes, it might be the right technique for your mare, but if you're doing it for commercial reasons and there's no value in the produce, then you know, obviously, if you're doing it for sentimental reasons or money is not the issue, then you know, obviously, this doesn't come into it, but that's very rarely the case with the clients I deal with you know it's about the kind of bottom line and how much it costs so 
And like mm. you said earlier, there are, you know, it's it's very much, I suppose, worth sitting down and really working out. Is it a management issue? Is it a, you know, is it a solvable, is it a solvable physical issue? You know, to figure these these steps out first yeah. before kind of jumping the gun. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, saying that, though, there's a lot of mares, like probably well over half of the mares that I do it on, they don't have any infertility issue. You know, they're perfectly fertile, but they want to use these stallions that are only available by ICSI. So with those combinations, you're automatically going to get higher results anyway, because the mare is perfectly fertile and young. The stallion is perfectly fertile. It's just that there's very few straws available um, and they're very expensive. So you get very good results. But if you want to fall by that stallion, then ICSI is the only route. So actually, you know, we talked about the infertility application. And, you know, when I started writing this, you know, 10 years ago, it was all about an infertility treatment. But now with its success, people are like it's a, a choice because of a stallion that they want to use. So it doesn't always have to be because of infertility. If you're like, no, I only want a Shaco Blue fall, then obviously the only way you're going to get that is by doing ICSI. Um, Before you kick to the next bit, maybe Neva, I'll just throw a couple of these questions at you just to, okay, to get yeah. them in. Um, there's one question from a young person here. Would you have to study to become a vet to be qualified in this area or this field or are there other options to enter it? Um, so if, I suppose if you wanted to get into the embryology side of it, um, you potentially wouldn't need a vet degree. You could have a science degree and then a kind of embryology postgrad qualification. Um, but if you want to be involved in the kind of procedure side with the mares, then you would need a veterinary degree to carry out the procedures. Um, but for the lab work, you can be like a qualified scientist as such. Um, but there would probably be like most people involved in the field would have a kind of a, you know, university, like at least a kind of postgraduate qualification in the area. Uh, would sending the mare to Aventia rather than the oocytes make a difference on embryo production if you think it's got to do with management and climate? Um, it's a really good question. So no on, so like on the same day, if a mare had 10 follicles here in Dublin or 10 follicles in Aventia, the results are the exact same because I kind of check them every single week. Um, but in terms of management it's a really good question like I've got mares that were in Utrecht last year that had a lot more follicles while they were in Utrecht but then obviously there's no control because maybe Utrecht had a different climate last year to Dublin or you know you'd have to have mares you know you'd I'm like it's very scientific about it I'm like you would have to set it up properly to actually answer the question um but also you would have to keep the mare there if you're if we're thinking management and climate has something to do with it then they have to spend the whole season of four to six months there and then you have to travel her there and then actually does that cost a, you know make it worthwhile for those extra four or five follicles per opu you know and um, so it's a good question but i think overall not you know and um, we're still kind of getting good results here without the mares having to go away last question and I'll, I'll put you before i let you come back to this is um in relation to like obviously the next step to everything is the recipient mayor you know and and choosing the right recipient mayor and having the correct recipient mayor and um, there's a, a question here is there any advice in finding suitable recipients yeah i mean that's like a really um kind of hot topic and one that i'm super interested in and um, because kind of the other side of my research is like the epigenetic effects of pregnancy and gestation and definitely the recipient mayor is extremely extremely important um, I suppose my advice would be you want a recipient that is as close as possible to your donor mare as you can. So that size, type, um, uh, breed, um, kind of, any, you know, you kind of ideally you would want to use her twin or her clone if you could. You know, that's the kind of mindset you have to think of. And then from there, obviously, you might have to compromise. But if your starting point is I want a carbon copy of my mare to put my foal into, then you're starting from a good place. Um, but I think like the people in the country that have a business offering recipients, like do that hard work for you because they know their clients very well and they know what type of recipients, you know, the clients want. So I think you can, if you're kind of renting a recipient from one of these people, you can be kind of sure that they have been selected for you. But if you're kind of going yourself to, you know, the sales or something to buy one, you know, you want to look for something that's very similar to your mare 
you want to look for a young mare and obviously zero reproductive problems. You know, you don't want a mare that, oh yeah, she hasn't had a foal in four years. You know, that's not the mare <laughs> that you want to waste your XA embryo on, you know. Good advice, yeah. Sorry, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you go again. <laughs> yeah, no worries at all. Um, so yeah, this is just to finish up. It's just to, just to kind of give you a real life idea of the success rate so i just chose four random mares that we've done recently and um, so we have um, and you can see here like i tried to pick a more broad uh, spectrum of mares that had fertility issues but as i said they really don't at the minute the mares that come are mares that don't have anything wrong with them and they want to use these kind of expensive and um, high quality stallions so uh, we've got three mares with no infertility history we've got one 16 year old multi paris mare a six-year-old maiden mare and a 19-year-old multi paris mare and then we've got our one mare that did come because she couldn't produce full or embryos anymore at 24 and um, so just to give you an idea and just like, to explain in case anybody doesn't understand the terminology the multi paris are ones that have had multiple folds yes sorry yeah yeah exactly yeah um so yeah just to give you an idea of kind of how successful but then how unsuccessful it can be as well to kind of give you both sides of the story so with this mare, we did two OPUs. We got uh, a total of 18 oocytes and she is kind of very productive with OPUs. So we've gotten five embryos from those two sessions. Um, but she started with kind of 16 to 20 follicles. So she was one of the mares that has the most follicles. Um, this mare came to us, she only had one OPU done. She only had five follicles. We got three eggs, but we got one embryo still. Um, then this mare, 24 year old, um, she had one session. She also only had six follicles. We got three oocytes, but no embryo from her. Um, and then this mare, three OPUs, um, 15 oocytes, so five per procedure, um, and ended up with three embryos. So there's not often, it's not like a predictable outcome. You know, some mares, do very well and some mares don't and they'll be on the same day obviously everything else is the same um, and it really is kind of up to the mare so if it's something you're considering it's worth kind of trying it out and as I said I kind of really wouldn't let people do more than two if we haven't got an embryo from that mare I'll say look this isn't you know because change in styling doesn't have as much effect as the mare you know so there's no point in kind of saying oh we'll try a different styling we'll try a different styling if she's not given embryos she's probably not going to give embryos and that's it um so we can that's it. a lot packed in inside of an hour yeah. <laughs> uh, Neve. well done um Sorry. there is another question here which i i'll, I'll uh, pose to you um, do you think artificial light or the use of artificial light i guess would improve the number of follicles and therefore open pickup um rate so in theory um light will kind of bring forward transition so if you want to do opu earlier in the year it potentially would, but like at this time of year when you've already got increasing light, it's not going to add to the number of follicles or productivity, I don't think. Um, I mean, it'd be worth trying because I'm nearly at the stage of like we'd try anything to get more follicles. Um, but in terms of the biology, like, I, you know, I, I do suggest that say if someone comes to me in November and the mare is an actual winter and estrus, which a lot of these mares don't go into anymore, you know, they still have some follicular activity. But if they are in winter and estrus, I'll tell them, look, put, be your mare under lights and then come back to me in four weeks and we'll see and often they then do have follicular activity but if they have follicular activity with kind of 10 or 11 follicles i haven't really seen light push that up to 20 follicles if you know what i mean question here should the recipient mayor have had a foal recently um so ideally you want to know that they can have a foal but like a untouched maiden mare would you know i wouldn't turn her away either so um ideally yes but in this market i think it's very hard to find a perfect recipient so i would use maiden mares all the time as long as she's a true maiden you know i don't want a seven-year-old maiden that has been bred for three seasons <laughs> you know i want a true maiden that hasn't been touched Another question here, um, this person is a three hour drive from the repro vet. Do you think this, and I'm assuming this is um, the travel, affects the fertility of the mares? 
It shouldn't. And there's actually a, a good few studies on cortisol levels and ovulation rates around that. Because you can imagine in the thoroughbred industry, that's huge. I mean, mares travel from Dublin to France for a cover and back again. So um, it's really, as far as we know, it doesn't affect it. And that concludes the questions that have come in. Unless I oh, now it's another one. As soon as I say it, how many times a week um, do you do collections? So at the minute we just do Mondays because that's uh, Aventea are extremely busy. So they only kind of give slots to each clinic on certain days and a certain number of slots. So we've got three slots on a Monday um, at the minute. Um, but going forward, potentially next season, um, you know, we still will be using Aventea, I'd say indefinitely for clients that want it. And then there'll be kind of a second option for ICSI with us, if that's also what clients want. Um, but Aventea, you know, offer an excellent service. So, um, and it works, you know, really, really well. So there'll be kind of the, the two options available. Question in, um, does the use of art uh, select for lower fertility and reduce breed genetic variation over time? Along with this, are there breed specific differences in the number of follicles produced? Will I read that again? Um, I think, so the first part of the question was... First part is, does, does the difficult. use of art select for lower fertility and reduce breed genetic variation over time? Um, so I think I would look at those as two separate questions. So I think in terms of infertility, the answer is potentially yes. And, you know, unfortunately, it's kind of the same question you could pose for human IVF as well. You know, does selecting for infertility and producing more foals then produce foals with lower fertility? Um, obviously when you're doing it in these young mares with the expensive stallions, that's not the case because we're not using infert infertile horses. Um, but yes, you could argue that for, you know, for subfertile animals, um, but it'd be the same as, you know, doing any techniques in a breeding program for AI or ET or human reproduction or cattle reproduction. So it's a kind of a, a wider argument than I have an opinion on really. Um, and in terms of genetic variation, I think it's actually the opposite because I think a lot of people are using stallions that were kind of, you know, that died in the 80s. So we're having a lot of kind of resurgence of maybe new or, or I mean, older genetics that have not been introduced in the pool recently. And um, so I think if anything, it's probably widening the pool kind of in that year than would be available otherwise. Um, and also, I always think, you know, in theory, like why should a stallion be allowed to have a thousand foals a year, but a mare only have one? So, you know, the fact that stallions breed like they do isn't reducing variation, but actually by allowing mares to produce more offspring, we're balancing that sheet and actually allowing for more variation rather than less, in my opinion, anyway. <laughs> well, I guess there's there's multiple arguments on that, I, I, I suppose, in the sense of, you know, we, we, are they are they are they all with the same stallion? You know, is it like are they are they you know, it's the, the choices that are made around that as well, too, I guess, you know. You could be here for an evening talking about oh, all yeah, of that definitely. and, the, yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. The, the the nuances of the market um that, that go with it. Oh yeah, um, definitely. I mean there's probably only yeah, five, six stallions that are being used at the minute for ICSI routinely. Um, for sure. But in terms of the mare bit, because I think people always think, oh, like the mare is flooding the market, but I don't think that's the issue with it. I think, as you say, it's probably the small pool of stallions. Um, are, the, are, are, are there breed specific differences in the number of follicles produced was the other part of that? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, in theory, yes, and it's more to do with so native breeds, for example, will the breeds that are less domesticated, like if you took a Connemara pony or a Dartmoor pony in February, you know, their ovaries are, they're still kind of naturally entrained with the environment in that you're going to be putting less energy into their follicular development and their ovaries and more energy into their coat and finding food and staying alive and stuff. So I think the more domesticated a breed, the higher the antrophollicle count in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah. Uh, I'll give you one more question and we will finish up then. Eve. How many days before collection um, procedures should you scan a mare to see how many follicles and what is the best size of follicle? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we scan all our donor mares on a Friday morning um, and we're looking for at least 10 follicles that are over one centimeter um, in diameter. So once they have that, then they get booked in for the Monday. And we always do kind of a double check on the Monday to make sure that like they still have that number and everything, but it very rarely changes. Um, between Friday and Monday, unless they kind of come into season, because often that big dominant follicle will suppress the growth of the others. So that can be tricky, you know, in the summer when they're cycling, sometimes it can change between a Friday and a Monday, but at this time of year, not really. It's been really interesting speaking to you. Can I ask you one last question, just I suppose as a wrap up from me, I guess, you know, in the seat that you're in at the moment with UCD and the work that you're doing at the moment, you know what's your what's your aspiration for this this area of work for let's say the next five to ten years here yeah i mean i think if that's that, not too if that's not too tough a question i suppose to pose to you um week. no not really like i think for me it would be to have the service available um for the irish breeders that want to avail of it and without having to take their mares abroad um, and i think that we're kind of already quite close to that which is really nice and um, because i kind of thought that bit would take longer um and then from kind of a, a personal point of view like my you know major interest is in the research side of it so i'd kind of like to see um us kind of perfecting the media that's used for embryo culture and um, quite a lot more and making it more equine specific and kind of tailoring that to each stage of the process and potentially tailoring it to different mares and kind of having the foals that are pro not producing more foals but producing foals that are as close to the foals that would have been produced should we not have done IVF if that makes sense so I'm kind of all about making the process as physiological as possible um, which is kind of my research interest it's great to have you here back in the country and uh, neve and and doing work uh, in our university here so you know uh, uh, i applaud what you're doing and um hope to see more exciting things uh, from yourself and juicy d in the future and really appreciate you giving your time to us all here this evening um and i also really appreciate the interaction from our audience tonight they've been great in uh, keeping the, the questions flowing and the conversation going. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll say um, a big thank you to you. I'd encourage uh, viewers uh, to communicate with me in between webinars as well. If there's, if there's topics that you'd like to, to hear more about, um, if there's suggestions that you have for future webinars and so forth, I'd be delighted to hear from anybody out there um, and, and let me know in between. So for now, um, thank you very much for your time tonight, mm -hmm. Neve, and most certainly for all of the information that you shared. It's a very interesting area and um, it was lovely to speak with you. And unfortunately, uh, Zoom is one of those rude machines that I just press the end button and it is a good night to everybody. <laughs> but um, we, we, we thank you for your time tonight. So good night to all our viewers at home and thank you very much for sticking with us. Good night. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks for having me.